Okay, it looks like I've got to finish out episode 12 with some pretty sophisticated stuff. If you're not, eyes aren't glazing over already. I promise I won't be in the Greek too long. What you see highlighted in pink is 42 syllables in the Greek. This is the second date line that Matthew is using because remember Matthew's padding the text. Okay, this is the second date line that he's using. And that corresponds to the disciples coming and asking him what will be the signs in the end of the age. Okay. So, from here, in English, the disciples came to him privately saying, to the end of the verse. It's 42 syllables in the Greek, and that's the second date line in Matthew. And the way date lines work is you look for and you look aft. So 42 years before Christ is talking in 30 AD is 12 BC. The question is what was it about 12 BC? And I don't know that I've got the right answer to that yet. One thing that sticks out, especially considering the year that Paul um, at least released the book of Ephesians, Luke doing it in the same year, is that in 12 BC that's when Quirinius was first a governor. It wasn't, you know, the when it talks about it in Luke Quirinius being a governor, the actual word isn't governor, it's leader. Hegemon means somebody who has some kind of authority or power and what he had authority and power over at that time when Christ was born was he was heading a garrison with um, the heir apparent of Augustus Caesar at that time in Syria and that would have been really important because uh, Herod dies that year and how are you going to collect the tax okay because Herod's dying he was known to be dying of syphilis that year so the question is you know fine you got to collect the tax for the governor the political governor of Syria so Quirinius would have to have the you know, what do you want to call it, the authority to go get the tax. And since he's at the garrison, he can take, a, you know, an armed force with him in order to protect it. So that was where he was at the time Matthew was talking about Christ being born. And it could very well be, um, because that would be known information now, and when Christ is talking in 30, that he's referencing the first time Quirinius had an office. He was, I mean, he, he wasn't exactly, he wasn't over Syria then. That was, he was consul. That was a one year long office. It was the highest office in the Roman Empire. And after that, you went to have your, you know, as it were, sort of like your, I don't know, reward was that you could go overseas and have control over a province. And they got rich off those things. So it was kind of like a reward. So in 12 BC, that would have preceded, of course, Christ's birth by eight years. And so that was when he was consul. That was his highest. And he was really close friends with Augustus. That's why I said, you know, in about 4 BC, between 4 and 2 BC, you know, there's, there's always that four-year problem to work with. Um, he was heading the garrison for Caesar. He was, like, in charge of. Um, the Caesar. Caesar in those days meant heir apparent. Well, no, it didn't in those days mean heir apparent, but for Augustus Caesar, his heir apparent um, was newly 21 at that point, and Quirinius was over that. So Christ might be making a play on that. It's something in 12 BC for this text, dating backwards, 42 years backwards from when he talks. It's a whole lot easier to know what he's talking about when he's using the 42 to go forward from his death. That will correspond to our 72, really in their fiscal year, it'd be closer to 73 AD. And of course we know that today is Masada. And what's really important about that is that Paul benchmarks the same point. But Paul benchmarks it with Hagius and he's using Christ's age, not a BC AD conversion. All right. I mean, it's their version of the BCAD, but it's, you know, it's we have to date it a little bit uh, earlier because of the, the four-year problem. 
they had the same four-year problem okay and so it's a little bit up in the air whether we're talking about Masada here at the 42 point because this is this is 42 syllables it's a separate clause um, it's a little more you know questionable whether we're talking about Masada as we know it which we call 73 AD or whether it's um, the actual downfall of the temple which Paul himself is marking using the, the 73 at the end of the three syllables Hagius is the word that Paul marks and at its end of course three syllables long is 73 so he's very definitely playing off this text okay the second date line therefore directly in Matthew without considering Paul it would be also 73 AD okay and I don't think Matthew's using Christ's age. He might be. But the point is, is that, is that, you know, 43 years, 42 years later, which, you know, because the fiscal years are different, you have to maybe add a year. Um, in our, to convert to our calendar. Um, he's very definitely referring to something to do with the downfall of Jerusalem, downfall of the temple, maybe the very end of it. Okay, so, and, and, you know, end of the age, yeah, end of the Jewish age, because the, the Jewish age overlaps with church age, because the temple had 40 more years to go, okay, and he might be bracketing it to the very end of the, the of Masada, because that was when, you know, all of Israel was pretty much defeated at that point. It was mostly defeated when the temple went down, but it wasn't completely defeated until Masada. And of course, that's when Josephus gets captured and all that stuff, because Josephus was at Masada. So, all of that could be, you know, referenced here. All right. That's the first thing I wanted to say about it. The next thing, and this is where it really gets complicated, is like I had closed before, well, I, I, I can't, do it all but if you go from Matthew 24 1 all the way to the end of the chapter okay the total number of syllables equals years is 1687 it's very important write it down because the math gets really kind of sophisticated now all right of the 1687 you have 560 syllables equals years here the starting point is 30 AD so this point at the end, 560 syllables equals years later, is 590 A.D. The first 490 after his death would take you to 520 A.D. 70 years with the voting period takes you to 590 A.D. Okay? The next paragraph, that's seventh in, in big terms, okay, goes from verse 19, the end of verse 31, and that's 476 syllables equals years later and the way the 490s the way the 490 timing works is 490 plus 70 plus 490 and then a new 1050 begins so a new 490 begins so the Lord is addressing the 490 that begins after the 70 closes so this would be the this this basically by the time you get here you're looking at 1050 years after his death which would normally be 1080, but he's cutting off 14 syllables. And the, in the Old Testament, they did that kind of thing, starting with Moses in Psalm 90. They did that to warn of time in jeopardy, that time might actually end. Now, if you cut off 14 years from 1080, where this is supposed to be ending at the end of verse 31, then you get 1066, which to most people who know anything about Western history, and it is Western history that's in view, all the prophecies about the West, that's not to denigrate anybody in Asia or anywhere else. It's just that, you know, all of this is surrounding Israel and it's centered on Israel. And so it's centered on the nations that had to do with Israel in those days, and it will keep on being a trend of history. So 1066, therefore, 
looking at the West, what was important of that date, and if you're a student, even a marginal student of history, you would know that 1066 was the Norman invasion. And why was that important? Because unlike the English who were taken over by the Normans in 1066, William the Conqueror came from Normandy, that's why they call it Norman. He asserted power over the churches in England at that time. Now the churches in England at that time were controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. They were extremely horrible and apostate and all kinds of horrible things were going on. And of course God says in Leviticus 26, if you screw up like that then I'm going to have you taken over. So in a sense you could argue that Leviticus 26 was wiping out England at that time. But by 1154, England somehow was able to throw off the Norman invaders. Okay, so if you're talking about 1066 to 1154, 1154, I can't show it on screen, so you're just going to have to do the math with me. Minus 1066, wait a minute. 1154 minus 1066, sorry. Start again. 1154 minus 1066 is 88 years. There's no particular significance to how long that was, but it's so that you know. It took that long. But to say that history is in jeopardy here at 1066 in the West is to say that Bible understanding, Bible learning, the desire for Bible, the ability to get Bible was total jeopardy so much that history might not continue. So what that's arguing is that positive volition of the Bible was strongest in England. Now when we look back in history we kind of find that out. Now is that for sure what it means? No. But it's plausible. Okay? Because everything we're doing here is still first draft. It's going to take a hundred years before people get real comfortable with this and be long after I'm dead. Okay? I mean, because I'm not a scholar, so a whole bunch of people, if they're even looking at this, which I don't know, if they're even looking at this, they're, they're going to be skeptical, and they should be. And they're going to come up with other ideas as to what this meter means, but the, its existence should not be in doubt. What my interpretation of it, um, in certain respects, should be in doubt, because I'm going through this as fast as I can, because I'm 62, and I don't know when I'm going to die. Okay? So if it's true that the Norman invasion is being marked here with the specific idea that the, Rome, the Normans are doing what they shouldn't do, they're trying to assert control over church, that's Revelation 17 harlot. Again occurring, this is post-Constantine, again occurring as a sort of attempt to, you know, create fake church which of course Paul had already warned about under the seven mothers in Ephesians 1 9 when he's there in that part of his meter which is 217 AD which is when Origen happened to be there because you know, that's all prophetic what Paul is doing it's prophetic satire against the church because it's politicizing at that point or trying to with the seven mothers and of course it finally starts to politicize and, and get institutionalized under Constantine but years after Constantine, years after the Western Empire fades, okay, because we're looking at 1066 now, that's when maybe he's referencing it because that's when there's yet another attempt to try to create fake church where the kings, remember the beast, that's always political power, political entities, political power, and the harlot depicts religion pretty much always in the Bible. So you've got political religion entity and that's what William the Conqueror was trying to create okay excuse me <coughs> so that's why he might mark history in doubt meaning that only the English were had been positive and even they start going down so then all whether the time will even continue is in doubt okay and look at how cute that is that he does that because look it could have been the rapture. That's the criterion for the rapture. Everybody asserts that, you know, oh, millions of Christians will be around and clothes will be falling from the air. No. It's more likely to be the great whimper. That there's nobody left 
who's going to believe in Christ and the, maybe there's just one believer left on the earth and he's got to finish his growth before God calls church home so notice they will gather together his elect from the four winds now this is specifically a second advent passage but <coughs> if you look at one um, one Thessalonians 4 417 which is where the word rapture actually comes from because in the Vulgate the word there for rapture is rapto duh it means to snatch up okay well that's what this verse is talking about except it's second advent but that's what he's going to do in the in the, at the rapture too except that the world isn't going to see that we just die however many of us are left and not necessarily very many and then we go up to the sky you know those people they don't physically die they just get raptured up and it might only be one person the Bible never says it's a mass event okay but you know it's the last trump it's not a great trumpet the wording is not this not the same here but Paul might be playing on it in 1 Thessalonians 4 17 it's not the last trump Okay, and it's certainly not the last trumpet that's in uh, who's he what's this revelation because the angel that's used for the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is an archangel. There's no archangel blowing any trumpet in Revelation. So it's not the same angel and it's not the same trumpet. And the same thing is true here, but it's, it's close, it's, you know, what do you want to call it, evocative, parallel idea. So it's really interesting that Christ breaks this here at 476 syllables starting in verse 19 going all the way down here. That's 476 syllables. It's supposed to be 490. So it means that the outcome of history is in doubt. And if you counted your syllables, you would get to 1066 here. Now, that's 14 more syllables to go. Paul uses the same meaning. For the 14 in Ephesians 1 10 it is a parallel problem a parallel result because when he's using it that's the Decius persecution and that's a direct result of Origen trying to convert the Severan mothers and they get really upset about those mothers being in control of the teenage children who are technically the emperors and there's this huge rebellion in Rome. From 217 to 250, it's called by scholars the crisis of the third century. That's the official name for that period. So Paul might be benchmarking this, okay, also when he plays with Ephesians uh, 110. Because it's like there's 14 missing and everybody's going to know there's 14 missing. This corresponds to Daniel 9.14, which is an indictment, so that's the meaning of the 476. And Paul is taking that extra 14 and sticking it in the middle of his other timeline. So he wants you to know about the 14 shortfall. It's, it's, it, it's in the whole of the timeline, but at the same time he's using 491s for the timeline. So he's inviting you to look at what we call verse 31 here in Ephesians 1.10. In Ephesians 1.10 the text is saying that it's for the summation of everything church. Okay, my pastor spent a lot of time on that verse when he was exegeting Ephesians. He spent seven years exegeting Ephesians and he said, you know, church is the summation of history in the angelic trial. Yeah, okay. So you can see why Paul might play a game with this. Okay, so then the other thing that you know is since this is 476 syllables and that's not the end of the chapter. Even though it's talking about Second Advent, it's not the end of the chapter. Then the Lord, it, as because this is actually a timeline too. Like I said, 1687 syllables, explicit text. But now we're going to add another 14 okay that's not explicit text and all of the writers in the Old Testament had ellipses like that where they leave out pregnant periods of time Moses started that 
story. He does it explicitly at the end of Psalm 90 and Psalm 90 verses 16 and 17. The same 14. Okay, and that's the whole purpose of this verse even being here. Okay, it's to redeem the 14. And then Paul therefore uses 14 syllables for Ephesians 1.10 to say church is the redemption of the 14. In other words, time can resume for Israel because church exists. Church is the bridge between the shortfall that results from Christ dying seven years early so that the next seven can play and therefore, by way of application, church is the redemption of 14, not just seven, because that second seven can't play until church completes. It's really clever and very sophisticated. So when you're reading this timeline in Matthew 24 alone, because the chapter doesn't end there, you insert the 14 that you realize is missing. And you know it's missing because just like what Daniel did when he was petitioning for the extra 14 in Daniel 9. Because his meter tells you that's what he's doing when you look at it. That's where his indictment ends is at 476. The indictment ends there. Then the prayer comes next in, in Daniel 9.50. So he's petitioning for the 14 years that are already short, okay, to be restored. And Christ is basically doing the same thing. He's not petitioning for it. He's, like, letting you know it will be. But, technically speaking, if at this juncture in 1066 the believers don't grow up, then the whole trumpet analogy will apply, okay? The tribulation will get kicked off because we'll get our trumpet, and then, of course, you have the situation where the second advent's going to occur seven years later. That's why this is so pithy in the dual entendre, okay? So here we insert 14 years. That takes us now to the end of the 1050, which is 10, you know, 30 AD plus 1050 equals 1080, with the addition of the 14. And then in his last paragraph, well, not really last, but the next, from verse 32 all the way to verse 44, now he's mirroring Daniel, uh, verses 4, 9, chapter 9, verse 4 through 9, 13, which is not quite the end of the indictment in Daniel's prayer. But it is the 62 weeks that God responds to in Daniel 9, 26. Christ is dying at the beginning of the 62 weeks and he's essentially letting them know that by doing this he's when he numbers this at 434 he's saying hi this is the end see because he says the son of man is coming oh, but he's still there see for this reason you must also be ready for the son of man is coming well if he is coming then that means he left you got that if he left, then that means he's going to die now. Because you must also be ready because the Son of Man is coming when you don't expect him. Okay, but he's there now. So that means he's leaving and coming back. Alright? Yeah, he's leaving now at the beginning of the 62nd week, two months after he says this, because that's in the next chapter of Matthew. And... So then when is he coming back? And he's saying, you don't know when I'm coming back. Okay, but Israel spent, Israel spent 2,000 years knowing when he was coming back. So now he's saying, you know, this ties back to Matthew 16, 18. I will build church on myself when I'm dead. I'm sorry that the Catholics are too dumb to live. They don't understand that. He's pointing at himself. Greek word Petra does not mean does not mean uh, Peter. Peter's name was Kephas. Okay, they screwed it up when they translated it into Latin to create a word Petrus, which didn't even exist in Latin at the time Christ spoke. They invented it 200 years later, and I already spent the videos proving that. Okay. Um, but the point here is that he's saying, "I am going." And I'm coming back when you don't expect me. Which means that, oh, the rapture that you... Well, they wouldn't call it rapture then. The tribulation wasn't going to start on time. And he's not going to come back when he was originally scheduled to come back, which was 57 years later. 
64 at this point because it's going to die now rather than when he was supposed to die seven years later. So this is their warning. He's basically giving them the rapture doctrine here. Okay, and then of course it has its close. And this is 217 syllables as I've said before. What we have to come back and look at is since this is 434 syllables, which Paul keys off and actually uses that as his syllable total for his own timeline, the difference between 434 and 490 is 56, which Paul, of course, also uses to front his own um, timeline because he's writing when Christ should have been 56, which is where Mary left off. And, of course, um, Christ is very well aware of that since He's using the same number of syllables Mary used right here. So Paul is making a funny. He's saying, okay, I'm going to use the same number of syllables that Christ used here because the doctrine is the same. And uh, I'm going to front it with the 56 so that, you know, that's what he's leaving out here so that you get the ha-ha because 434 plus 56 is 490. In other words, time, you know, he'll keep his promise, which is the 490 is a way of saying that. Um, and so Paul uses that first, okay, to sort of make you tie in first to this, because the total is 434, but the 56 is part of it. Okay, so it also adds. It's an equidistant function of the meter to do the same number in front and in back. So here he's doing an equidistance with the 56. Okay, playing on what the Lord's saying in this passage now, highlighted in too dark blue, from 36 to 44. Okay? Now, if we do the same thing and supply the missing 56, okay, from verse 32 all the way to verse 44, at this point, remember, we were at, we were at 1080. So now we're going to take 1080, 1080, Add 476, and that gets you to 1556, but now we add the extra 56, and that takes us to 1612. That doesn't look right. Let me see. Wait a minute. Um, oh, I know. I'm not doing it right. 590 is where we stopped. Then we add... 476 and that gets you to 1066 and then you add 14 and that gets you to 1080 and then you add 476 and that does get you to 1556 and then you add the missing 56 on the 434 and you get to 1612. I don't know what 1612 means but I know no may known is plotting out the actual years during this section right now. So you'll have to look at the Frank Forum. Um, you'll have to look at the Frank Forum link. I, I hate it when it does this. You have to look at the Frank Forum link to see what event 1612 might mean. But it's 1612 right here at the end of verse 44. Okay, including the missing 56. It's 1556 before you add the extra 56. Now. This is what's going to be so shocking, okay? Once you go forward here, you got an extra 217 years. I almost fell over when I found this. If we go 217 years forward of the 1556 I just talked about. Wait a minute. 1556 plus 217 you get 1773. Now, I don't know if that's helpful to you or not, but it should be, okay? Um, 1687 is the total, okay? Plus 30. Without the 56, this piece here, when you get to the end of the chapter, it's 1687 syllables, but it starts at 30 AD. So at the end of that chapter, without the insertions of the 15, 
of the 14 and the 56, you get 1717 AD. And when we first went through this, and you'll see it in the Frank Palm uh, thread, it's like, what the heck is 1717? Well, it's kind of like 1066 in its meaning, which means that we might be hitting the right item. 1717 was the start of something obscure, but really meaningful, called the Bangorian Controversy, and you can look that up in Google. It was basically a guy in a, in a, at Bangor Abbey, okay, saying, Hi, King George, you know, George, the George of the American Revolution. Hi, King George, you do not have the right to rule over the church. The church is independent of you. And he, he, at that point, church was not the Roman Catholic Church. It was just any church. Freedom of religion was basically being asserted. And it got to be called the Bangorian Controversy because it tip, tipped off a whole bunch of, you know, clerics and everybody arguing over whether or not the king had a right to be head of the church. Well, I don't know if you remember too much, but 70 years after that, uh, the American Constitution became official in 1787. And what distinguishes America from everybody else is that we were founded based on freedom of religion, where there's no king and there's no state church and everybody believes whatever he wants, good, bad, or indifferent. That still distinguishes us today. I mean, there might be other countries today who, you know, have that as their, what, whatever you want to call it, their guideline. But we were the first. There was not a country prior to that that was founded that way. Okay? So, for those people, and I've always disputed this, but for those people who are trying to say that the U.S. is in the Bible, well, yeah, maybe. And what's really interesting about it, because this is where it would occur at the end of this sentence, the last sentence in the chapter, See what it says, cut him to pieces. I don't know why I can't get this thing. Cut him to pieces, assign him a place with the hypocrites, weeping and gnashing of teeth. When people left Europe to go to what became America, that's what they were considered to be doing. That they were going to, 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 to hell. Okay? They were out ostracized, they were outcasts, or they wanted to be ostracized and outcasts, and they just left. My own, my own uh, family line, one of them, actually comes from that. Some Catholic guy married a Protestant girl, no, pro the girl was Catholic and the guy was Protestant. And they came over to America in order to you know, escape persecution. That's how my family line in America got started. And it was like 1540 or something in my case. But see, this would be 1787. Not 1540, it was, um, I have to look up the year, it wasn't that early. Okay, 1540 is what, when the guy's parentage got started. But the, the point is, is that that is really satirical. Of course, all the text is satirical for a specific period. So it might actually mean that, especially if, you're counting the 56 that's in here, okay, plus the 40, I mean the 14 that's in here, because that's 70 years. So by itself, by the time you get to the end of verse 51, you're looking at 1,680 syllables, which when added to 30 AD equals 1717. And like I said, the obscure event is the Bangorian controversy, which is really a speech by some cleric to King George saying, sorry, you don't have a right to be king and to control our religion. Okay, and that's that ticked off a huge amount of arguments and controversy within England and by extrapolation most of Europe. But it was civil. I mean, you know, they didn't, they didn't go to war over it. And what makes that even more interesting is remember I said here is where Paul cuts it off and that in the meter that's 555 AD. Okay. 
and and that you know the rest of this um you know the rest of the the, the i'm sorry the, no it was right here i'm sorry I must not that must not that's 555 a.d and the rest of this is 35 syllables in the greek okay that would take you to 590 the rest of this well no from sorry i can't get this thing to work that takes you to 590 a.d this was 555 well when i went to look up what the heck was 555 one of the other obscure things i found get this the Bangorian Abbey was founded in 555. So is that why God gives Paul to bracket this? Because he's saying, okay, here's something related to this obscure, uh, you know, nobody, I never even heard of it myself. Bangor in England, an abbey. Instead of Downton Abbey, it was called Bangor Abbey. Okay? And then you get all the way down here, and by the time you get here and you add it to his death, you got the Bangorian controversy. In 1717. Is that what he's doing? And then when you add in the ellipses here, the 56. And up here, the 14, you got 70 years later with the, with the Constitution being in 1787, which is due to what? The people who come here wanting to be free of a king who governs their religion and not have a state religion. It's a little too cute to be coincidental, okay? Now, is that make it sure that's what it is? No. Everything's first draft. There could be something else that is, you know, much more certifiable. But what I hope you understand is that this is obviously very um, deliberate. If the answers I'm coming up with are the right ones, I'd be really surprised. But there shouldn't be a doubt that this is deliberate. And if you doubt it, hey, now you know some of the main points, and you'll have the Greek in subsequent episodes. I'm going to go through how Paul is tracking to the exact words for the exact years he wants to use. And then, anonome non, in the thread in Frank Forum, which will be in the video description, he's doing his own tracing independent of me for these words and this timeline. And play with them. Or not. I mean, this is really definitely the stuff of masochists. Okay, next episode is going to be 13. Peace out.